Good afternoon. It's really a joy to be with you all. It's it's always nice to visit other assemblies. Every every meeting has its own sort of flavor. So it's always nice to 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 visit and to experience remembering the Lord with other believers and it's always an enjoyable time. There's been something I'd like to share with you all today. It's been something that's become more and more precious to me over the last few years, and it's been something that keeps coming up in my in my studies. The <clears throat> first place I'd like to read. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> first place I'd like to read is in the Epistle to the Hebrews. We'll read in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, and just for context, we'll read verses 16 through 18. For he does not indeed take hold of angels by the hand, but he takes hold of the seed of Abraham. Wherefore it behooved him in all things to be made like to his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For, in that himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to help those that are being tempted. And then we'll also turn, just turn the page to chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and... Again, for context, we'll read uh, verses 14 through 16. Having therefore a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast the confession. For we have not a high priest not able to sympathize with our infirmities, but being but tempted in all things in like manner, sin apart. Let us approach therefore with boldness to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace for seasonable help. So there's something really beautiful in these two passages that relate to the Lord Jesus and how he is able to relate to us. And the the thought that I, I have and the thought that's been something that I keep finding in my life and I keep learning to appreciate more and more and it's something I... To be honest, I feel like I've always really underappreciated the ability of the Lord Jesus to understand us, to understand our suffering, to understand our hurt. And the, the idea, um, there's a physics term called resonance, and resonance is, uh, it, it relates to two objects vibrating at the same frequency. They're vibrating in the same way. And the Lord Jesus is able to do that with us emotionally. He's able to feel and and sympathize with us when we suffer. And there's something so beautiful and so profound about that, that we have Jesus, the Son of God, that God himself is able to relate to us when we suffer. We don't have a God who is so far from us, who doesn't know what it means to suffer. We have a God who came in flesh. He became a man. He suffered here. He understands what it means to suffer. And there's something just incredibly, incredibly encouraging and incredibly beautiful about that. When you read the gospel accounts, when you read the accounts of the Lord going to the cross, when you read the accounts of the Lord on the cross, the, the things that he says when he's on the cross, most of the things that he's talking about, most of the things he's saying, he's addressing to other people. He, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He says to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. He says to John and to his mother, behold your son, behold your mother. Very little does he let us in to what he's feeling. So what, what happens 
the, the only two expressions we have that give us even a little bit of what's going on with the Lord Jesus. One, he says, I thirst. I'm thirsty. And he's saying that to fulfill prophecy. He's saying, I'm thirsty. The other thing we have that really lets us know what's going on with the Lord Jesus emotionally is he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only thing he tells us, the only thing he he lets us in a little bit to what he's feeling, what he's going through on that cross. When he's being forsaken by God, when he's paying for sin, when he's bearing our judgment on the cross, that's the only thing he tells us. And, and he does it intentionally. And the, the beautiful thing about the Lord Jesus being able to sympathize with us, so when I suffer, the Lord is able to sympathize with me because he suffered, but it also works the opposite way. So when I suffer, I'm able to experience in a very small way a little bit of what the Lord Jesus suffered. So that I'm able to enter in a little bit to what he went through. And it, it's something so beautiful because if I never suffer in my life, if I never go through any hardship, if I never suffer, I'm not able to appreciate as well as I could as going through suffering. So when I suffer, it, it gives me the ability to have a little bit more of an appreciation of what he went through for me and for you. And you'd say, Lord, is there any other way that I could learn a little bit more without having to do that. And I I would just like to turn to Psalm 22 and just look a little bit. So we have a lot of prophecy. We have a lot of messianic psalms. We have a lot of, of passages in the Old Testament that that speak about the suffering of the Lord Jesus. We have a lot, a lot that we can draw on. But this is what he quotes from when he's on the cross. This is where he quotes from. Of all the references, of all the things he could say, this is, this is what was in his heart. This is what he's feeling. And this is what he's, he shares with us. And, and we'll just, uh, I'll, I'll read just a few portions of it. But Psalm 22, To the chief musician upon Ijaleth Shahar, a psalm of David, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou far from my salvation, from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, and thou answerest not. And by night, and there is no rest for me. And thou art holy, thou that dwellest amid the praises of Israel. Our fathers confided in thee. They confided, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They confided in me and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, Commit it to Jehovah. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him because he delighteth in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me trust upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have encompassed me. Bashan's strong ones have beset me round. They gape upon me with their mouth as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is become like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my palate, and thou hast laid me in the dust of death. For dogs have encompassed me, an assembly of evildoers have surrounded me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may count all my bones. They look, they stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But thou, Jehovah, be not far from me. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only one from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Yea, from the horns of the buffaloes hast thou answered me. We'll, we'll pause there for a minute. So we have this song. We have this, this beautiful song written. And this is what the Lord Jesus quotes while he's hanging on that cross, while he's suffering, while he's dying. 
for you and for me. And this psalm, this is a psalm that was written by David. We don't know the circumstances that were going around in David's life that inspired him to write this. Some of the psalms that David writes, he'll tell you specifically what happened that inspired that song. We have that from Psalm 51. We have a psalm when he's fleeing from Absalom, his son. He has a song when he was hiding in the, in the cave. We have a song when he pretended to be mad in front of the king of the Philistines. We have certain songs, you know the context. This song, we do not know what David experienced that made him write this. And it's beautiful because that gives us the opportunity to take this for ourselves. And we see the Lord Jesus did that too. There are, this song was sung by many Israelites. This song was a song that many, throughout the generations of Israel, they could claim this song for whatever, whatever issue, whatever they were struggling with, whatever they went through, they could sing this song. And we have also the Lord Jesus identifying with David when he, when he quotes this song, we also have him identifying with many children of Israel who sang this song to the Lord. And so he, he identifies with his people in his suffering. And the beautiful thing is, you, you, you read through this, he, he first starts in verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my salvation, from the words of my groaning? says he feels abandoned by God. I don't know if you've ever suffered. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But sometimes it feels like God is far when you're suffering. And you're crying out to him, but it feels like he's so far. And that's what, the, that's what David's saying. He says, God, it feels like you are far from me right now. And he says, I cry by day and you're not answering. And by night and there's no rest. It feels like you are really far away. But then he says in verse 3, And you are holy, you that dwell amid the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They, they trusted and you delivered them. They cried and were delivered. So he says, I, I feel this way. I know who you are. I know you're the one our fathers trusted in. I know you're the one who delivered them. I know who you are, but the way I feel right now doesn't match up. And sometimes sometimes we know what the Bible says about the Lord. Sometimes we know the truth that's in here, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way when we're suffering. Whatever it is, maybe, maybe there's an affliction of our bodies. Maybe someone in our family has died. Maybe something with our possessions, our home, our jobs. Maybe we're enduring persecution. Maybe... We're suffering in some way. And you know who our God is. We know who he is in our minds, but our hearts don't feel it. And, and that's a normal thing to feel as a believer sometimes. And he says, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. I know you are able to deliver me in this situation. I know you're able to deliver me in this situation. And then in verse 6 he says, but... I, I know those things, but... I am a worm and no man. I am a reproach of men and despised of the people. He, he feels less than human here. David feels less than a human being. He feels, he, he's been brought so low. He feels less than, less than human. I don't know if anyone's ever made you feel that way. I don't know if anyone's ever made you feel like you were less than a human. But the Lord knows what that feels like. And so he can resonate with that with you. He knows what it's like to feel abandoned. The whole, you read the Gospels, he felt abandoned in the garden. He wanted his followers to stay up with him and they could not. They all run away from him. He's left alone. In the trials, there's no one standing with him. Everyone's against him. And then you have ultimately on the cross... Where he, where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows what it's like to be abandoned. He knows what it's like to be alone. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. And he can resonate with that. He knows what it's like to be made to feel less than human. Think of the torture that they did to him. The beatings, spitting in his face, mocking him. 
Just think of what they did to him. He knows what it feels like. And then he says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, Commit it to the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him because he delights in him. This is something that they actually directly said to him when, uh, when he was being, you know, during his, his passion. This is something they, they said to him directly. I don't know if they realized they were quoting this, but they said, let's see if the Lord will rescue him. He trusted in the Lord. Let's see. As they mock him, he knows what it's like to be mocked. I don't know if you've ever been mocked, but he, he feels that way. He knows what it feels like. And then, as, as David goes, goes forward, he says, but you're the one that took me out of the womb. You made me trust upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from the womb. You are my God from my mother's belly. I have always followed you. You have always been my God. I have always been committed to you. I've always followed you. And, and he, you see this conflict in his heart. He knows who his God is. He's always been faithful to his God, but the circumstances around, he doesn't feel, he, he feels like God is far away. And then he says in verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And then as he goes forward, he says, Many bulls have encompassed me. Bashan's strong ones have beset me round. They gape upon me with their mouth as a ravening and a roaring lion. So he's surrounded. He's being oppressed on every side. He feels like the walls are closing in. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but just everything is against you. You feel surrounded. You feel like there's no way out. And then verses 14 and 15, we have, this was literally fulfilled on the cross. He says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. When he would hang on the cross, the the design of the cross, you would dislocate your shoulders and your elbows from hanging so long. His bones were out of joint, literally out of joint, the Lord Jesus. His heart has become like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. The, the extreme stress that the body is under, that the heart is under, you would develop uh, pericardial effusion. It's fluid that surrounds the heart. The heart's in a little sac called the pericardium. And as it's under that strain of the cross, you would develop fluid there. Sometimes the heart muscles could actually rupture. Um, And he says, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. Verse 15, my strength is dried up. My tongue cleaves to my palate. He would be extremely dehydrated. The the process that he went through in the garden, sweating, um, drops of blood, he literally sweat blood in the garden. There's a, there's a condition when someone is under extreme anxiety, the, the little blood vessels around the sweat glands can rupture and you sweat blood. Um, I believe it's called hematohydrosis. She's a doctor. Um, I, I think that's the name. It might, might be slightly different. But there, it's a condition that you can literally sweat blood, which is what happened in the garden. So he sweats a lot there. He lost a lot of blood during the, the scourging, when he was whipped, when he was beaten, he lost a lot of blood. On the cross, he's hanging, he's bleeding from several places. He's dehydrated. And that's why, that's why it's not surprising for him to say, I'm thirsty on the cross. He's extremely dehydrated. And his tongue cleaves to his mouth. So he knows what it's like to be dehydrated. He knows what it's like to be weary. He knows what it's like to feel pain and to suffer. And this is the God of the universe. This is the one in Hebrews, it says, by whom he made the worlds. This is the one who created everything, and yet he, he, he understands what it is to feel pain. He understands what it is to be thirsty. He understands what it is to be weary, to be hungry. He... he He took on all of this for us. And we have here, he says, And thou hast laid me in the dust of death. He says, For dogs have encompassed me. 
An assembly of evildoers have surrounded me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may count all my bones. They look, they stare upon me. Again, they pierced my hands and my feet, literally fulfilled on the cross. But we also have here, I may count all my bones. They look, they stare upon me. When he was scourged, they used uh, what's called a cat of nine tails. It's a whip with nine, nine ends that they would put in pieces of bone, pieces of metal, pieces of rock that would tear the flesh off the back. It, it would get down to bone. It would expose bone. So literally, again, fulfilled by the, by the Lord in his death. Again, they, they part my garments among them. They cast lots upon my vesture. But thou, Jehovah, be not far from me. O oh, my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only one from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Other than verse, other than verse 11, verses 19, 20, 21, this is the first time he's really making any request. The whole time, he's just telling the Lord how he feels. And I think that's another beautiful thing we can learn here. So when I suffer, when I pray to the Lord, the Lord genuinely wants to know how I'm feeling. We have in the scripture, the Lord knows what we need of even before we ask. The the Lord says it in the Sermon on the Mount. Your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask. So pray. Pray. And you'd say, why do I need to pray if he already knows what I need? He wants to know what you're feeling. It seems to me that God is genuinely interested in how you feel. And that's another beautiful thing. The God of the universe cares about how I feel. And he wants to know how I'm feeling when I'm suffering. He wants to know. And you can tell him. You can say, Lord, it feels like you are abandoning me right now. It's incredible that we could utter something like that to the Lord. That he, he wants to hear that. He wants, Lord, I'm really struggling right now. You can tell him how you feel. It's something just so beautiful about Christianity that I can tell the Lord how I feel and he listens to me and he wants to know. Our God is so wonderful that he's willing to do that. He's so far above us and yet... He cares enough to know about, about my feelings. And we have, the, this psalm is really two distinct parts because you have this beginning where you have, you have the, we don't know what happened in David's life to inspire this. We know something must have happened for him to sit down and want to write something and we know the Spirit of God worked to, to bring this to the Word of God for him to write this song. We don't know what happened, but whatever he went through, he was delivered from. And you see the Lord brought him through the other side. So that's where we have the, the second half of this psalm. And, and, and then he goes into praise. He says, Yea, from the horns of the buffaloes you have answered me. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear Jehovah, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and revere him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise is from thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise Jehovah that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto Jehovah, and all the families of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is Jehovah's, and he ruleth among the nations. All the fat ones of the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and he that cannot keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done it. So clearly, whatever happened in David's life, maybe he wrote this in two sections. Maybe he wrote the first half when he was suffering, and then when the Lord delivered him through it, he wrote the second half. Or maybe he wrote it after the whole experience was over. Regardless, when we're suffering, we can bring 
all of our feelings to the Lord. We can make the requests to Lord, save me. Lord, deliver me. Don't be far from me, Lord. Be here with me as I suffer through this. We can make those requests. And then when the Lord comes in, we can praise him. Because we know, we know who our God is. We know, we know what the word of God says about him. And we know that all things will work together for good to those who love God. It doesn't always feel like that in the moment. And maybe it's something we're going to suffer through for a long time. But if and when the Lord brings us through it, we can praise him and we can just glorify him. And, and, and even at the end, he, he's saying, I'm going to let the next generation know what you've done. And not only them, the, the next generation is going to serve you because of what you've done, what you've brought me through. I'm going to let them know. And so it's a beautiful thing, too, that when we suffer and when the Lord brings us through it, we can tell others, say, listen, this is what the Lord brought me through. This is where I was. This is what I was feeling. But he delivered me from it. And he came in and he helped me. And we should praise him for that. And it's, it's beautiful. I also just want to look one more passage. We won't, we won't read the whole thing. But just to get a sense that this is... You, the feelings that David had are not unique. Uh, we also have in the, the book of Job, if you, we don't have time to read it, but uh, if you have time, some, sit down, read chapters 16 and 17 of Job. And you'll see very, very similar things, very similar feelings that Job has to how David feels in Psalm 22, to what the Lord just cues us into a little bit while he's on the cross. So, so Job says, well, just all of his friends have spoken. Job's lost his entire family. He's lost all of his children, ten children. He's lost all of his property. He himself is covered in boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He's in intense pain. He's grieving the loss of his children. He's lost everything. And his friends come and they sit with him silently for a week. They don't say anything. And then Job finally opens his mouth and he curses the day he was born. And then his friends start to talk to him. And they say, Job... This is happening for a reason. You must have done something to bring all this out. And the reality was, no, Job hadn't done anything. The Lord was testing him. And the Lord was using this to refine Job. And we'll see near the end that the Lord has something to address in Job's heart. But Job hadn't sinned outwardly in any way to to bring this out. But Job, Job lets them into how he's feeling a little bit in chapters 16 and 17. He says, in the beginning of 16, he, he basically says, you guys are terrible comforters. If you were going through this, I would have words to comfort you. I would encourage you with my mouth. And he says in verse 5. But he says in, in 6, if I speak, my pain isn't eased. It's not assuaged. And if I, if I don't speak, if I forbear, how does that help? He says, nothing is helping right now. And, and he, as he goes down, he says in verse 8, You have shriveled me up. I, I, there's leanness in me. It beareth witness. He says in verse 10, They gape upon me with their mouth. It's almost directly the same quote from Psalm 22. He says, um, His arrows encompass me round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. He says, my face is red with weeping and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Um, he, he, He says, my friends are mockers. As he goes, as you go into chapter 17, um, he says that he has made me a proverb of the peoples, a song of the one. I am become one to be spit on in the face. As he, as he goes, he says, <clears throat> I, I cry to the grave, thou art my father, to the worm, 
my mother and my sister. Very similar expression to Psalm 22. So Job, very different experience from Psalm 22. We don't have any record of David ever going through something as extreme as what Job went through. And, and the experience of Job is very different from what the Lord Jesus went through on the cross. But they're all having the same feelings. Job feels less than human. He says the worm is his mother and his sister. David in Psalm 22 could say, I am a worm and no man. I feel less than human. I feel like I'm below the dirt. I'm so low. He feels dried up. He feels shriveled up. David said the same thing. I'm, I'm poured out. My tongue cleaves to my palate. There's, there's nothing in me anymore. And, and you see the same, the same types of feelings. But the, the wonderful thing is, the Lord Jesus resonates with us. Job's friends couldn't resonate with him. Job's friends, they didn't understand what he was going through. They thought they were encouraging him in some way, but they're just insulting him. They're making him feel worse. They're not contributing. But when we suffer, the Lord Jesus comes alongside us. He's felt those things. He's felt those feelings. And so it says in Hebrews, there's mercy and there's grace to help in time of need. That he is one who can help us because he's felt those things. And suffering is never, it's never enjoyable. It hurts. It hurts to suffer. It hurts to lose someone. It hurts to have something wrong with your health that you can't control. It hurts to be in pain. It hurts to grieve. It hurts to go through something. But it helps us know a little bit more about what the Lord Jesus did for us. We sang about his suffering love this morning. We sang about what he endured for us on the cross that he would go to the cross for us because he loved us. And he loves us so much. And sometimes he allows us to suffer. Sometimes he allows us to enter into things that we would never choose to enter in if we had the choice. But he does that because he loves us, because he knows the end result. He's trying to bring us somewhere. He's trying to help us to grow. It hurts to grow sometimes. My son, he's starting to get teeth. He cries, and he cries, and it hurts. You can tell he's uncomfortable. And it hurts to grow. But it's important. And you always wish, is there any other way you could have taught me this lesson I needed to learn? Did I have to go through that to learn that? Couldn't you have, wasn't there any other way? The Lord knows what's best. And not only that, not only does he want us to grow, not only does he care about us, but... He's suffered too, so he knows. And he's there for us, to help us, to be that source of encouragement that we need. We can lean on him. We can trust him. We can go to him. The beautiful thing is, I can tell him how I'm feeling when I'm suffering. When I, It's something that was so foreign to me to learn that I can really, I can tell the Lord how I'm feeling. I can open up my heart to him. And he wants to hear it. And not only that, but he, he genuinely cares about me and about what I'm going through. And it hurts him too. He hurts with me when I suffer. Read John 11. See how he was in Bethany with Mary and Martha. He suffered with them. It hurt him to see what happened to Lazarus. It hurt him to see how they were feeling, how grieved they were. And, and he, he cries with them. We have a Lord who weeps with us. And that's beautiful. No other no other religion can claim to have a God like we have. He's not far from us. He came. He came here. He lived a life here so that he he suffered. He was tempted so that when we are tempted, when we suffer, we can go to him knowing that he knows what we're feeling. And may we just be encouraged and may sometimes when we suffer, we can also be like the Lord Jesus and and try to show mercy and grace to those who suffer too. We don't always know exactly, we don't always go through exactly the same trial. We don't always suffer exactly the same way, but uh, we're, we're sometimes 
we, we can relate to others who have suffering and maybe we can help them as well maybe the Lord can use us to encourage those who are suffering we can weep with those who weep we can mourn with those who mourn and, and the Lord uh, allows us to suffer sometimes so we can help others mm. it's not something you wish that again if there was another way Lord I'll take that option but it's not always the choice may we just be encouraged by this and uh, may we just be thankful for the opportunity it's as time goes from the suffering from the trial sometimes it gets easier to be thankful sometimes you can look back and say I know you were working on me and I'm thankful that you brought me through that and I know you were teaching me something it wasn't easy but thank you Lord maybe we can close in a word of prayer Our God and our Father, we are so grateful for your word. We thank you that we have this before us. We thank you for your Son. We thank you that we could remember him this morning. We thank you that he loved us so much that he would go to the cross for us. We're thankful, Father, that we have the Old Testament, the the Messianic prophecies and Psalms, that we have a little bit of the ability to just get a taste of what he went through. But Father, we thank you that we have a Lord, we have a high priest who sympathizes with us, that he understands how we feel. Lord, it's, it's so humbling and amazing to think that you know what we feel when we suffer. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. We, we are so grateful that we can go to you that we can receive help, we can find grace, and we can find mercy in times of need. We are, we are so thankful for this, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would bless us the rest of this day. We pray that you would bless us through this week. Help us that we would look to you in all things, and that in all things we would honor and glorify you and know who you are, even though sometimes the circumstances don't feel the way we know you are. But we just pray, help us that we would know what the Word of God says and cling to what the Word of God says and know that somehow you will bring us through whatever we're going through. We, we bless you this morning, Lord Jesus. We praise your name. Amen.